actually, let's talk a little bit more about creatine. Um, we talked about it really briefly on one of our podcasts, but we we were kind of at the end. So I want to kind of go back and make sure people understand that it's one of the supplements we get the most questions about. It's also one of the supplements that we feel the most confident telling patients, like, if, you know, this is a supplement worth taking. It's clearly passed test number one, which is it's safe. Uh, and it passes test number two, which is it's probably got efficacy. Um, well, I shouldn't say it. it's got efficacy. The real question is, you know, are you okay with a little bit of weight gain? Because that's, you know, you're going to pull more water in. So yeah. um, explain to people a little bit about why creatine is so important. And presumably this is something that's really important in powerlifting. I'm guessing going into a bodybuilding meet, you probably don't want creatine for that extra weight or do you? So I think it's actually great for bodybuilding. Okay, great. So, I want to hear about it because I, I assumed it would, you'd have a little more water, but maybe the water's all in the muscle and that's where you want it. Yeah. So, uh, so creatine is a high energy phosphate donor. So it, in, in muscle, it exists as phosphocreatine. And when you take supplemental creatine, uh, you'll, it'll come into the muscle. It'll get a phosphate attached to it, phosphocreatine. And originally, the, the only mechanism we thought of was, well, it's a high-energy phosphate donor, so people will yep. perform better. But then we saw people increase their lean body mass, increase their strength, uh, and there's even like benefits in terms of cognitive benefits appear to be pretty clear that there's some cognitive benefits as well. Uh, so as you mentioned, like in terms of safety and efficacy data, I mean, to me, there's no strikes I, really. I tell people, I'm like, I don't even know why we're having this conversation anymore. And it's also, you know, it's gone up in price a little bit recently because of the supply chain stuff, but it's, it's still relatively it's inexpensive, incredibly inexpensive for, for what you're getting. Yep. So, you know, when I see people talk about like some of these other supplements and they're not even taking creatine monohydrate and I'm like, well, you're, you're stepping over pennies or sorry, you're stepping over dollars to pick up pennies because this is just the lowest hanging fruit. But are you still, even at your size and even at your demand, is there any benefit to taking more than about five grams a day? Some people have postulated there might be. I haven't seen really clear evidence for it yet. You could argue that there's really no downside to taking the extra. The, the downside might be some GI irritation. For mm -hmm. some people, creatine can be a GI irritant, which I, I think we'll circle back to. Um, but... We know it, it can act as a high energy phosphate donor. So when you are exercising or just doing anything, you your energy currency of your cells ATP. And in order to drive muscular contraction, your ATP donates a phosphate and that liberation of that phosphate to form ADP and a free phosphate is energetically favorable and helps drive these muscular contractions. Um, so creatine can act or phosphocreatine can act as a high energy phosphate donor to reform uh, ATP and allow you to perform better. But it's also a really powerful osmolite. And so it pulls water into muscle tissue, which in and of itself may actually be anabolic. So uh, mm. like just a muscle cell being more hydrated, there's some evidence that that can actually improve the that it's more anabolic environment. Uh, but regardless of the mechanism, we do know that when you take creatine, you see improvements in lean mass. And some people will say, well, that's just water. Well, but that's what muscle mostly is. But isn't muscle it? is 70 percent water. Yeah. So whether it's and there's actually research to show that even non contractile, just water improves, may improve strength and contractibility. So, so we're not sure exactly how. Mm. But it could just be like the volumization of the cell is just a benefit. There's also sort of a, you, you could also kind of make up at least conceptually a framework that says a more hydrated cell is more able to calculate, uh, more, more able to carry out its function, right? So right. if the function of a myofibril is contractile release, contract release, and it has more water, it, it sort of seems logical to me that it's going to be better at clearing metabolic waste mm -hmm. and recruiting fuel which would at least be two things that would factor into its, its ability to do that. Yeah. I mean, the other thing about it is um, if you look at like anything that improves hypertrophy, a big portion of it is water. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not just all myofibrillar. So I think regardless of the mechanisms, I mean, it's pretty clear that this stuff works. It's pretty clear it's safe. Uh, I mean, they've done 
numerous randomized control trials, some of them being well over a year long. Um, yes, you get an increase in creatinine, which can be a marker of renal function. But I think one although thing- the data, you know, on this lane, there was a paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago that we were really happy to see. We've abandoned looking at uh, looking at serum, you know, uh, creatinine for renal function because it's just too easy to get fooled by people with varying muscle mass yep. and training volume. So yep. we've completely abandoned it. So every time you order labs on somebody and you see their creatinine, it'll tell you what their estimated glomerular filtration rate is. We just ignore it completely. We only look at cystatin C. Mm-hmm. So everything we do is based off that. And there was a paper in JAMA a couple of weeks ago that basically said as much, which is maybe we should look more at cystatin C instead of creatinine. So so I would even say that you know hopefully this is a, a, a PSA for other docs out there listening and other patients to say, please look at my cystatin C as a way to estimate kidney function. Yeah, I, I tell people, you know, there's some other things that can get a little bit wonky, like from lifting weights, like liver enzymes and whatnot. Um, and I tell people, you have to keep in mind, these, these are markers, okay? So if you have liver failure or you have kidney failure, it's very, very likely you will have elevated liver enzymes and elevated uh, creatinine. But just because you have elevated liver enzymes or elevated creatinine does not mean that you necessarily have damage to those tissues. So you have to disconnect those two. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that, you know, I feel like correlation versus causation is just not something that's taught very well in school. Because I even see um, not really good doctors, but some physicians get so hung up on just, well, this is on the page and this is supposed to be in normal range and it's not. And it's like, but just look at the person sitting in front of you who obviously works out, is in good shape. If you're concerned about their their kidneys, then do a 24-hour urine collection or an ultrasound or, or whatever you have to do to verify that they're safe. But yeah. I mean, I, I just, I don't worry about that kind of stuff. There's also been some people um, who have said, well, creatine can cause hair loss and you, you've got to be careful about that. Um, I'm not, I don't think the data on that's very compelling at all. So there was a single study that showed an increase in DHT from uh, supplementing with creatine. One study, 2009, I've never seen it replicated, never seen any follow-up. How much did DHT increase by? Oh, I'd have to go back and look. I can't remember the exact amount. It was significant. Sure. Um, but the interesting thing is we know creatine doesn't affect androgen levels. So it's kind of like, where is this increase in DHT coming mm-hmm. from, right? Like it has to come from somewhere. And we, like I said, there's no randomized control trials showing that creatine actually causes changes to hair follicles or um, actual hair loss. So maybe it does, but I, I would think that if that data existed, we probably would have seen it already. Do we think that there are significant benefits from, from supplementation even on non-lifting days? So for example, on hard cardio days, assuming we're not talking about sprints. So clearly there would be a benefit in sprinting because the creatine phosphate system is really lending to that uh, ATP generation during that incredibly high intensity stuff. But like if you're out there doing a VO2 max day, which is, that's a really hard day. Those are Mm -hmm. kind of three to eight minute all out intervals, um, which is aerobic. It's peak aerobic. Do you still get a benefit, do you think, from creatine? I would guess yes. Um, there was a recent meta-analysis that came out and looked at like different ways of taking creatine. And <laughs> it was useful data, but it, it, it in some ways it was kind of uh, frustrating because they basically showed, well, if you take five grams a day, you get increases in lean mass and strength and performance. You take more than five grams a day, you also get increases in lean mass and performance. But it's hard to kind of compare them directly yeah. uh, based on the way they did the meta-analysis. And then they also looked at, okay, if we just take them on lifting days, okay, you get benefits. If you take them on non-lifting days, you also get benefits. What I would say is that you probably can get away with just taking it on lifting days. um, But keep in mind that the benefits of creatine are an accumulation. So you've really got to saturate the muscle cell. That's that's the key. Because when we were kids, you would load it. Right. You would do like, I feel like you did 30 grams a day for a week or something crazy. Yeah. And then five grams thereafter. And I, of course, this was reading Bro Science magazines. You would then do that for a m- couple of months and then you would come off it for a month and then you would repeat the cycle. Am I making that up or is that about? No, no, that was definitely yeah, yeah. a thing. Um, so the, I, I will say that the research does show if you load it, 
you will saturate the muscle cell faster. Now, I always try to tell people like there's no solutions. There's only trade-offs, right? Mm. So the trade-off with this is a lot of people will get pretty bad GI irritation with loading creatine uh, in terms of like uh, GI uh, bloating, mm. uh, nausea, those sorts of things. So um, if you just take- If you're playing the long game, it doesn't really matter. Right. I mean, you're, you're talking about getting the results you want in- one week as opposed to three weeks. Yeah. Like, it's really not a big difference. So if you just want to take five grams a day, within a few weeks, you'll be saturated and you'll be getting the same benefits. So it's really, I guess if you were somebody who'd never taken it before and you've got like a, a big athletic event coming up and you really want to be on it for it, that could make sense. But for most people, I would say just take five grams a day. Mm. And when people kind of say, well, you know, what if I just take it on lifting days? Yeah, you probably could, but it's also like, it's pretty darn cheap. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually I don't think it's be... just easier to not forget. It's easier to forget something when you only do it on certain days. Right. Sometimes it's just easier to make it a part of the routine. Yeah. And what I would say too is people ask me about timing of yes. creatine, yeah, those sorts of things. There's some really small, really tenuous, I really want to emphasize that, evidence that perhaps after a workout might be better than before a workout. But I tell people, just take it whenever you'll take it regularly. So for me, I just get up in the morning and I take it. And and that's what I worry about. Now, as far as like the cycling on and off, so there's evidence that you do reduce your endogenous production of creatine when you're on it. There's also evidence that the creatine receptor on the muscle cell does downregulate a little bit. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that doesn't mean that your intracellular levels of creatine are falling. So they've actually never shown that even like far out that those phosphocreatine levels in your muscle drop. So what I would say is I don't really think there's a reason to come off because they have shown that if you do come off within a month or so, kind of everything goes back to normal, yeah. but you lose the benefit of the supplemental creatine. So I would say as long as intramuscular levels of creatine are not falling, there's really no benefit to coming off. I mean, it used to be like, I think people kind of just equated supplements with steroids. And yeah. so like, well, you're supposed to cycle steroids, so we should cycle supplements. And, you know, creatine is not hormonal. It's not the same biofeedback loop. So I would say there's probably no reason to cycle it.